Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast. Today's episode, questions and answers number one. Today's podcast, uh, I have to dedicate to uh, the person who got me interested in Russian history, actually, from the beginning, my mother, who passed away this morning. Uh, she's the side of the family that my Russian side comes from. Uh, she was born Ala Demyanov, uh, later Ala Shaus. She got married 66 years ago to my father, who passed away earlier this year. And he was the one that got me interested in history in general. Those nice long walks with the dog and telling me about, you know, the past and mythology and history. And so this is dedicated to mom. I know you're listening today, mom, for the first time. Uh, and also today's podcast is a different one from any I've done in the past, as it comes entirely from you, the listener. Over the past year and a half in which I've produced the Russian Rulers podcast, actually today is exactly one and a half years from when I started, uh, I've gotten quite a few questions. Uh, so today I'm going to answer some of them so everyone can enjoy it. Uh, some of them come from the uh, Facebook uh, fan club page, the Russian Rulers History Podcast, and uh, others come from the uh, RussianRulers.podhoster.com website, and this has been going on for a little over a year and a half. First one's from Gideon. After issuing of the fundamental laws in 1906, the Tsar was arguably in a stronger position than he had been before the revolution of 1905. How far do you agree? Well, Gideon, that's a great question. Uh, yes, the Tsar was in a stronger position, but I think in the long run it actually weakened him dramatically. Uh, it gave much more fuel to the fire of the uh, opposition because with the uh, October Manifesto, he was making this a constitutional monarchy where the people could actually have a say. What the fundamental laws did was, yeah, you think you have a say, but I'll tell you what you're allowed to say is basically what he told the people. And I think that was a really big mistake on his part. Had he stayed with a constitutional monarchy and led and listen to the people, the Bolsheviks especially would never have gotten into power because their whole argument was that the Tsar was corrupt, that he was never going to do anything right for the people, and that the Romanovs in general were bad. Well, with the October Manifesto, it looked like, hey, maybe this guy isn't so bad after all. He's a good Tsar. He listens to us and we can go on. But I think he made a really bad decision by putting out the fundamental laws uh, he really believed that he was the only you know, way to rule Russia. He was Russia. Uh, and that was kind of delusional, I believe, and uh, it led to his downfall. Uh, the second question is from Alexis. What part of Russia were your grandparents from? Well, this you know, fits pretty much today. My mother was never in Russia. Uh, she was Russian, but she was born in 1923 in uh, Sarajevo, and uh, lived in Belgrade for uh, her young life. Her grandparents emigrated in 1918, I believe, and they came from St. Petersburg, uh, just a couple blocks off the Nevsky Prospect, which is one of the main streets in uh, St. Petersburg. They were, uh, according to my mom, they lived about a mile or a mile and a half from the Winter Palace, not too far from there, uh, and they were part of the Russian Admiralty, at least uh, some of the male members of the family. Uh, they were pretty well off. Uh, and my godfather was another one who came across. And he, uh, when my uh, grandfather passed away in 1925-26, uh, uh, he was uh, a demolitions expert. And he was uh, showing people how to uh, take care of a hand grenade when he passed a kidney stone, of all things, and the grenade went off. Uh, but my godfather took over. He was also from St. Petersburg, and he, you know, helped raise the family until he passed away another 10 years later. Uh, my grandmother lived to the ripe old age of 91. She came to the United States via Italy, and uh, probably in about 55, 56. Never learned much English at all. Uh, stayed, you know, pretty true to her Russian heritage. Uh, my parents came over in 1953 to the States. I was born five years later. They both became American citizens pretty early on. And uh, 
But they kept their uh, roots in Russia. They were part of what they call Rokor, which is the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. Uh, very, uh, you know, deep into the church. Uh, matter of fact, the Metropolitan, uh, Metropolitan Hilarion, who's now the uh, head of the church outside of Russia, he was uh, considered my parents his godparents. And uh, of all things, he is uh, right now in the Seattle-Tacoma area where my mom was when she passed away for uh, what they call the Holy Synod is being held right now. The church and 300 bishops from around the world are coming to the Seattle area this weekend. Uh, it's actually had to uh, postpone my mom's funeral because uh, they weren't able to get uh, church ready in time because there were so many people coming. So that's my mom, you know, always pick the time. Uh, next one's uh, third question from Mike. Now I have a few questions for you. How long does it take for you to produce a show? Do you have other podcasts? And what tips do you have for potential producers? Well, the first one is, uh, how long does it take? It takes me somewhere from between five to 10 hours a week to prepare and to record one of the podcasts. One of the things that I really do, uh, and this is a tip for anyone, when I look at my material, I make sure that there are multiple sources that I'm looking at. Uh, I have probably about oh, 30 books on Russian history and a number of other resources that I look at. So I'm very careful. Uh, one of the best ones I, I really believe in is the uh, uh, History of Russia by Ryazanovsky and Steinberg. But even in the book that I looked at, there was an error where they called uh, one of the assassinated Romanovs the cousin of Tsar Nicholas, but it actually was his uncle. Uh, so I have to go back and look at the different books to make sure that what I'm going to write down is, you know, what the history you know, was like, what, what the truth was, because that's a very important thing for me, making sure that it's verified. And, you know, I, I you know, read the books over and over. And there's some really long ones, you know, anything by Orlando Figs uh, on Russia is going to be monumental. Uh, so there's, there's quite a bit of material out there. So, you know, I really take some time on it. And that's one of the tips I have is make sure that you really verify what you're writing. And, uh, you know, don't rely on Wikipedia. I've seen too many errors there where uh, I'm going to have to go in and start changing the encyclopedia in my spare time. And I do have another podcast. Uh, this is my the podcast that I'm going to be uh, restarting again. And it's uh, called Lab Interpretation at Podhoster.com. And it's called Let's Talk Real Health. And uh, I do uh, do a lot of talks around the uh, world on health issues, uh, especially things on environmental health. And uh, I've been doing that for a number of years. It's been my uh, avocation and, and my job for many, many years since uh, the early 80s in healthcare. And so uh, that's the other one that I do. Question number four from David. Do you think a stronger willed Tsar would have been able to hold on to the throne or would events like the Russo-Japanese War, World War I, the People's Will, would have knocked anyone off the throne? No half-stepping here. Either Nicky the Great reigns for 30 years or loses his throne. That is a debate that so many Russian historians have gotten into. My point of view is, had we had a Peter the Great, I think there's a lot of things that would have been done differently. Uh, first off, uh, I got to tell you, I, I would, the, the first beginning when we had the, the uh, uh, tragedy at the Kadinka field where the people were uh, stampeded to death. I think someone like Peter the Great would have gone to the field and would have with his own hands helped the people. He would have had so much of a better reputation than Nicholas did who kind of hid from things. Uh, I don't think he would have ever married someone like Alexandra. Or if he did, he probably would have divorced her eventually and would have uh, not had that kind of a problem that she was. Never would have let anyone like uh, Rasputin have anything to do with his family. Uh, the Russo-Japanese War, I think what we've seen with Peter was he would have lost the war, but he would have learned and he would have told his people, you were going to rebuild this and do it right. And he would have really gotten into that. So those nine years between the Russo-Japanese War and World War I, I think Peter would have had Russia well prepared for the war and it wouldn't have been the disaster and with the millions upon millions of people being killed. I think, yes, 
if Nicholas II had the will and the greatness of Peter the Great, as an example, I think he would have reigned for 30 years and would not have lost his throne, and there would not have been a Bolshevik revolution as it was. So great question, David. Thank you. Next one, fifth question is from Steve. If you had the choice to live in any part of Russia's history, when would you choose? When was it best to be a Russian? That's a kind of loaded question. Uh, I guess it is very difficult to say. Russia is a very sad history. Uh, when I'm done with the rulers, I want to get to the people who are just unbelievable. But one thing I would not ever want to live is the life of a serf. Uh, that was miserable. Uh, aside from short uh, lifespans, uh, you didn't get to choose who you were going to get married to on the most part. Uh, it was your master who would do it. They were slaves. They had a miserable life. And that's, you know, half the population of Russia pretty much was that way. Uh, the boyars, they did better, but, uh, you know, I, I could only see being uh, one of the uh, rulers. <laughs> Definitely not Paul or Peter the III. Uh, but still, it was tough. Uh, you know, I don't know if there's a time period which would have been better to live in. It, it's a very hard question because it was a hard life in Russia. Remember, this is a very cold nation, very northern, a vast country. You know, from my understanding and from what I've seen on TV since I've never been there, gorgeous in many places, but a very hard life to live. So I, I think I'll stay with where I live right now in uh, Reno, Nevada, and, you know, in a much more comfortable time. Six ones from Scipio. Uh, of the Russian rulers, who would you like to share a table with? Well, the first one I'd like to share a table with, which may sound odd, is Ivan the Terrible. I'd love to, to understand him more and what his thinking was. I remember a lot of people wrote about him and kind of twisted things a little bit because of you know, the damage he did to the boyars and, and the Oparchnika and Oparchnina. It, it was a harsh reality what he had to do to become a supreme autocrat. And I think that we may have given him a little bit of a hard time uh, for all the things that he's done. Uh, you know, and the fact that maybe he wasn't that crazy, but maybe he was very sly and, and smart. It was just history looks at him very poorly. Of course. I mean, obviously the second one would be Peter the Great. I would love to. To, to sit there with him. And I don't think you could sit with Peter the Great. I think you would have to walk with Peter the Great. Uh, I think with his boundless energy, you would have had to, he couldn't have sat down very long. Uh, so he'd be the second. Uh, Catherine the Great, of course, want to know a little bit more about her and her thinking. And then Nicholas the Second. I would want to know, Nicholas, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? What were you doing and why did you do it? Uh, you know, he is a saint in the Russian Orthodox Church, and a lot of people have to understand his sainthood is not any relationship to his rule. It was that he sacrificed himself as a very spiritual man, and that much I think, you know, we, we can say that this man did sacrifice himself and his family, and sainthood, I can't argue with that. Uh, his rule, uh, abominable, uh, one mistake after another, and I'd like to know why. Number seven from Martin. I'd like to know how long your average serf lived to. What was the infant mortality rate in Russia, and how did it compare to to Europe? Well, the if you lived to the age of five, you would have made it on average, and this is males, to 29 and a half. Uh, females would have been about 24 because of uh, dying during childbirth. If you made it to 20, you were likely to make it to about 50 for males, about 40, 44 for females. Uh, infant mortality, astonishing. 45% of children died before the age of two. Uh, just an astonishing number to think how many. And how did it compare to Europe? Pretty close. Uh, Russia was maybe a little bit worse, uh, but when you look at the... Uh, you know, the, the people on the lowest end of the economic uh, scale in Europe, they did pretty much about the same. It was a pretty harsh life. Uh, you know, no antibiotics. You broke a leg. Uh, that could kill you. Uh, you know, infant mortality, incredible. So it, it was a harsh life, and, and you know, 
But Europe wasn't doing too much better until probably, you know, the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. Now, from Eric, this is the hardest one. Whom do you think is the most popular saint in Russia? I know St. Andrew is the official patron saint, but they also revere St. George, St. Nicholas, St. Sergius, plus the canonized rulers Vladimir, Olga, Alexander Nevsky, Dmitry Donskoy, and of course the Virgin Mother. Well, if we look at saints, uh, St. Andrew, of course, he is uh, you know, more of the disciple of Jesus that he really you know, made the official patron saint uh but you know when you look at the very popular ones and and you know if any of you out there have some differences of opinion with me you know please do you know send me a message on that the uh, first one would be and i'm going to do this in alphabetical order and not in who's most popular because frankly that's very hard to say but alexander nevsky you know the prince of novgorod grand prince of vladimir he was so famous for the battle of neva the battle of the ice he's the a patron saint and considered by a poll to be the greatest person in Russian history. So I think, you know, he's got to be one of the top. Uh, two of them, uh, Boris and Gleb, the children of Vladimir the Great, as they were the first saints canonized in Kievian Rus. They were the first Russian Orthodox saints, the purely Russian saints. So I think they're important. Dmitry Donskoy, uh, you know, war hero. First prince of Moscow to challenge the Mongol authority in Russia. He was so famous for the Battle of Kulikova, which began to crumble the Mongol grip on the people of Russia and how you know, incredible of a leader he was. And he died so young because of what he took on. So I think very, very important. Uh, another one, uh, St. John of Kronstadt. He's the patron saint of St. Petersburg. Uh, mystic and religious writer. Uh, when we do prayers in uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, they do pray to St. John of Kronstadt. So very important in Russian history and was able to give us a lot on the thoughts of Russia and, and Russian Orthodoxy. Uh, you would have to say Olga of Kiev. Uh, she was the first woman ruler of Rus. Uh, she was the first Christian amongst the Russian rulers. Remember, she went to uh, Constantinople to uh, become baptized and take in orthodoxy. So it was before Vladimir. So she's very important to the Russian people. Another one, uh, Seraphim of Sarov. Uh, he extended monastic teachings, uh, the theory of contemplation and self-denial to the layperson. He taught what the purpose of Christian life in Russia was to acquire the Holy Spirit. He's very, very revered in Russian Orthodoxy. Uh, you know, it's such a hard life for the serfs. This was a way for the church to uh, give peace. Uh, some would say, you know, they were controlling the people because of that. And you can take that point of view. But for him, it really was to try to uh, soothe the soul of the, uh, of the downtrodden serfs and the uh, peasants in the uh, countryside and the cities. Very important. And then lastly, uh, St. Sergius of Radnez. He is the patron, one of the patron saints of Russia, spiritual and monastic reformer. He founded the Trinity Lavra of St. Sergius, and he blessed Dmitry Donskoy before the Battle of uh, Kulikova. So he's a very, very important person in uh, Russian history. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that today. Uh, Mom, I'm glad you... Uh, with that again, uh, and I hope you finally got a chance to listen to my podcast uh, and uh, looking down at us from heaven. Uh, I thank everybody for listening, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. I have some more uh, that I'll be doing the next time I do this uh, question and answer session. Uh, next week we'll be starting up uh, about one to two weeks, uh, depends, on uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, don't forget to come to our Facebook uh, fan club site, the Russian Rulers History Podcast. We've got great lively discussions going on there, and more and more people are joining every day. And uh, also, you can go to russianrulers.podhoster.com, and you can leave a comment, make a suggestion. And uh, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.